Well, hello everyone. I'm super excited to start off a brand new video series. Uh, I've talked about it a little bit in my past videos, and we're going to be dealing with Rachmaninoff III talking about analysis. Before we jump straight into the analysis, I kind of wanted to start off with an explanation of why I'm doing this. Uh, as I mentioned, these videos are being sponsored by uh, my friend Yevgen, who is not a professional musician. He got into the topic of Rachmaninoff and he discovered my videos on YouTube, the previous vlogs that I did, and wanted to go even further digging into some analysis. He's worked with theory professors, various piano professors on learning this work. And so from his perspective of a person who's a non-musician coming to this music, um, he wanted to have a series that explained to people uh, not musicians, in layman's terms, kind of what's going on, understanding this piece, uh, what's happening here. Okay, I tried to figure out that uh, formula of beauty to find like what, what is so specific about this uh, concerto, which is so interesting. I couldn't find any information about it. I couldn't find any like easy explanation about the structure of it. To listen to something as long as 45 minutes or whatever. <laughs> Maybe we can uh, excavate this structure. For those of you who are already subscribed to this channel or have seen my other videos, I'm going to guess that you're already fans of classical music, at least to some extent. But of course, a lot of individuals are not as well versed in the classical world, so they don't understand when they do go to a concert sometimes what is happening. You have these very long works of music, 45 minutes in length in the case of The Rock 3. Yevgen told a story of how he was talking to a lady after a performance of The Rock 3 and she said it was a test of endurance because she had heard someone say it was a test of endurance for the performer and she took that to mean it was a test of endurance for the listener. Uh, my goal as a musician is to play in a way that is not a test of endurance for the audience and that rather is something that they can go away from, feel that time actually moved very quickly because they're so engaged with the music. but. For the, for the audience, it also helps to have some understanding of what's happening structure-wise so you're not completely lost in this work of music. And not just the Rock 3, but any symphony or concerto or sonata that you might find yourself listening to. So for those who did not attend music conservatory or have a formal classical music education, uh, it's important to understand that these pieces do contain structure. It's not just random notes following one another, um, and Rachmaninoff did use these earlier classical forms. A lot of you may be familiar with song forms, and you might not even realize it. Uh, in modern culture, we're much more familiar with songs that are three to max five minutes in length. Usually, you won't even find a song that long on the radio. But most rock and pop follows a particular format, which would be verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus. Um, it's done that way, and it's been done that way for so many decades for a reason. It stems back all the way even to folk music because it allows people to remember the song, to relate to the song, and when you see these patterns repeated over and over, uh, it provides a sense of familiarity. So you expect something to happen, you expect that chorus to return, or in the rap song you expect the hook to return, or if you're listening to electronic music you expect the build up and the drop. We've heard them so many times that we realize that's coming. What a good composer will do is he'll balance the expectation of what you know is going to happen and change it slightly in a way that is unexpected. So if you have too much of what you already know, it's going to be very boring. If you can predict everything in a movie or a plot, you're going to lose interest. If it's everything is unexpected and there are too many twists and turns, then you just lose track of everything. And again, you get bored because you can't follow a pattern. A lot of functional harmonic music is this balance between the expected and the unexpected. And I think that 
the greatness of the structure within the music allows some of these pieces to become the masterpieces that they are and to have such a universal appeal for so many years. Uh, if you think about architecture of these cathedrals and these churches or concert halls, ones that stay for hundreds of years, it's because they have this wonderful foundation and structure uh, which holds up everything and then on top of that structure there are all these ornaments and things. Um, it's very similar when it comes to music. Another analogy other than architecture could be that of a novel. Um, you know, novels take days or weeks to read depending on the novel and the nice thing about a concerto or a symphony is that you can transfer a great deal of information and understand it in a shorter amount of time. So as you can see we have a spreadsheet which was created by Yevgen um, explaining kind of what's happening with themes and I really like what he did with this with color coding because it's easier to understand. Uh, this block here is all the first movement and uh, we're going to be taking the themes one by one. Um, first, the next video I'm going to make is going to cover theme one of the first movement. Uh, you can see here it is in orange. It comes back here in the development. It comes back a couple times at the end and even transfers into a couple sections in the second and third movement. Uh, these numbers here on the left, these are measure numbers. So I will be using, um, I have my piano score here. I have an orchestral score, actually two orchestral scores that I got from the library. And I'm going to be comparing and showing different examples of particular things that Rachmaninoff does, how he uses these themes, how he develops these themes. And you'll notice here on the left, we have uh, E, D, and R. Uh, in the third movement, we also have E, D, R followed by a C. The first movement follows what is called a sonata allegro form. It's a classical form that was used by Mozart, Beethoven, Haydn, uh, and used all the way up until the periods of people like Rachmaninoff, still used to this day. Um, e stands for exposition, D is development, and R is recapitulation. I often think of music in terms of grammar, we're dealing with two modes of communication. So with speech, you have grammar and syntax and punctuation. You have those same things in music as well. If any of you learned to write a, a five paragraph essay in school, um, this was one of the very first things I, I learned in writing research papers back in middle school was you start off with an introduction and a thesis. You have your supporting arguments in paragraphs two, three, and four. Uh, and then at the closing paragraph, you restate what you talked about in the thesis. So you have your main argument, your supporting arguments, and then your restatement of the main argument. So the exposition could be considered something like that first paragraph and the development, you develop those themes, you take them and you move them in a different direction, you introduce new concepts before finally returning at the end. Knowing that and linking those different concepts together is very helpful to understanding what's happening. So in the exposition, typically you'll have more than one theme. You'll have a theme one and a theme two for the sake of contrast because just having one theme uh, can get a little boring. So what Rachmaninoff does is he has two themes which go through the first movement, the first one. And it goes on. But that's the main theme, which was taken from some Russian Orthodox chants. We'll get a little more into the details of that. But the contrasting theme, which comes in uh, measure 93, is in a different key and it has a different mood. So that, so not only is it going to be in a different key, but it will usually have a different feel to provide some emotional contrast. Etc. So, so you can see how the two themes interplay with one another. And in analyzing those themes, you can compare and contrast the similarities and the differences. Uh, one sort of surface level similarity that I see right at the beginning is how the, th the first theme goes uh, downward. 
and the second theme reaches more upward. Uh, so it's almost like a little flip of directions of the notes themselves. In it, the Rhapsody on a theme by Paganini, Rachmaninoff uh, did this flipping upside down idea, also called uh, inversion. So this becomes just by flipping something upside down. Uh, that's just one example of many things that you could do with themes. They could be completely different. They could have uh, gradual similarities and differences as time goes on. And then we come to the development section where he takes fragments of themes which you've heard before, um, introduces them, moves to more and more distant key centers. Most concertos have something called a cadenza, which is where the orchestra drops away and the instrumentalist plays a lengthy solo. I've made a video on the cadenza. Uh, you can check it out on my panel on my channel from the past. And it definitely uses those themes from especially the first theme. Becomes and he does a, a bunch of wonderful things with it, which we'll dig into in the upcoming episodes. Now, in addition to this spreadsheet, we'll be working with something called Mind Map, or um, made by a program called Free Mind. It's a free uh, open source software, which I was previously unfamiliar with. Um, this is again uh, made by Yevgen and his theory professors. Um, my apologies that some of it's in Russian. We'll be able to hopefully translate that soon. But the basic idea behind this software is that you can fold and unfold uh, movement. So if you look at at this right here, uh, we have the rock three, movement one, movement two, movement three. Um, this is the exposition, development, and recapitulation. And if I click on this here, it will unfold the entire um, exposition and we can go through it piece by piece. Um, so we're zooming in from like a bird's eye view, getting way down into the details of every single measure. So I'm going to be dealing with both the large scale and the small scale aspects of this piece. With the large scale, we, we talked about the Sonata Allegro form, and then uh, dealing with something called phrase analysis or harmonic analysis by phrase. Uh, you can think of it as having the movements being chapters of a book and then going down into the subchapters and the paragraphs and then the sentences and the sub sentences and the words themselves. In this phrase analysis, we're going to be talking about harmonic function. So what is a function? In a nutshell, harmonic functions uh, show that within every key, there are chords that are more stable and less stable. We call this tension and resolution. So some chords feel like they need to resolve, and some chords are very stable. And the journey of what happens between when you go from chord to chord to chord and how it tracks through the piece is going to tell the story of the piece. And again, as musicians, when we understand these, uh, we can play around with them, try them in different ways, and it's all about that communication with the audience, having them understand it. One of the best compliments I can receive or I have received as a musician is when people tell me after a concert, oh my gosh, that, that felt like it went by so quickly. When a musician understands the relationships between the themes, and when the audience is hearing those relationships, um, it's a very interesting phenomenon because it feels like you're a little bit outside of time. So you're dealing with these large structures, these large-scale bird, bird's eye view, down to the very small harmonic functions on a chord-to-chord -chord basis. And hopefully you can tie those all together in a way that makes sense and in a way that's really exciting. So the way I'm going to go through this project is I'm going to have a number of supporting examples. I'm going to have videos of me playing, uh, some overhead view on the piano. I'm going to have charts and spreadsheets like this one, along with others, annotated sheet music, um, both in files and in scores, piano reduction score, 
um, orchestral score, as well as using graphics, images, and texts. I'm basically going to do everything I can to try to make these concepts understandable to a person who hasn't even gone to music conservatory and is just interested in the music. At the same time, I'm going to try to not make it so elementary that uh, a musician can't gain something from it. So hopefully everyone will get be able to gain something from this series. Thank you guys again for watching. Please feel free to comment, like, and subscribe, um, and stay tuned because more videos are coming up.